James Fortin from Now Is Your Time by Walter D. Meyer. The genre is biography. A biography tells about a person's life, but is written by another person. As you read, look for events in time order, information about what the person accomplished, and why he or she is important. James Fortin was born in Philadelphia in, 1770, in 1766 and grew up during the American Revolution. He overcame great obstacles to become one of the most important African Americans of his time. Thomas Fortin, a free African, was employed by Robert Bridges, a sailmaker in Philadelphia. Sailmaking was a profitable but difficult job. Sewing the coarse cloth was brutal on the hands. The heavy thread had to be waxed and handled with dexterity. A person trying to break the thread with his hands could see it cut through his flesh like a knife. But Fortin appreciated his job. It paid reasonably well, and the work was steady. Fortin helped in all aspects of sailmaking and assisted in installing the sails on the ships of firm service. With the income from his work, he had purchased his wife's freedom. Now, on this early Tuesday morning, a new baby was due. The baby born later that day was James Fortin. Young James Fortin's early life was not that different from that of other poor children living in Philadelphia. He played marbles and blind men's bluff. He raced in the streets. When he was old enough, he would go down to the docks to see the ships. Sometimes James went to the shop where his father worked and did odd jobs. Bridges liked him and let him work as much as he could. But he also encouraged Thomas Fortin to make sure that his son learned to read and write. The Fortins sent their sons to the small school that had been created for African children by a Quaker, Anthony Benefet. He believed that the only way the Africans would ever take a meaningful place in the colonies would be through education. Thomas Fortin was working on his ship when he fell to his death. James Fortin was only seven at the time. His mother was devastated but still insisted that her son continue school. He did so for two more years, after which he took a job working in a small store. What James wanted to do was to go to sea. He was 14 in 1781 when his mother finally relented and gave her permission. America was fighting for its freedom, and James Fortin would be fighting too. He knew about the difficulties between the British and the American colonists. He had seen first British soldiers and then American soldiers marching through the streets of Philadelphia. Among the American soldiers were men of color. A black child in Philadelphia in the 1700s had to be careful. There were stories of free Africans being kidnapped and sold into slavery. He had seen the captives on the ships. They looked like him, the same dark skin, the same wide nose. But there was a sadness about them that both touched his heart and frightened him. He had seen Africans in chains being marched through the streets on their way to the south. He never forgot the sight of his people in bondage or accepted it as natural that black people should be slaves. But the black soldiers Fortin saw were something special. Marching with muskets on their shoulders, they seemed taller and blacker than any men he had ever seen. And there were African sailors, too. He knew some of these men. They had been fishermen and haulers before the conflict with Great Britain, and now they worked on privateers and navy ships. Sometimes he heard talk about naval battles, and he tried to imagine what they must have been like. In the summer of 1781, James Fortin signed onto the privateer Royal Lewis, commanded by Stephen Decatur Sr. The colonies had few ships of their own to fight against the powerful British Navy, and issued letters of mark to private parties. These allowed the ships under the flag of the United States to attack British ships and to profit from the sale of any vessel captured. The Royal Lewis sailed out of Philadelphia in August and was quickly engaged by the British vessel active a heavy armed brig sent from England to protect its trade ships. The Royal Lewis's guns were loaded with gunpowder that was tamped down by an assistant gunner. The cannon, then the cannonball was put into the barrel and pushed against the powder. Then the powder would be, powder would be ignited. The powder had to be kept below decks in case of a hit by an enemy ship. Fortin's job was to carry the gunpowder from below to the guns. Up and down the stairs he raced with the powder as shots from the British ship whistled overhead. There were large holes in the sails and men screaming as they were hit with grape shot that splintered the sides of the ship.
The smell of gunpowder filled the air as Captain Decatur turned his ship to keep his broadside guns trained on the action. Sailors all about Fortin were falling, some dying even as others cried for more powder. Again, he went below decks, knowing that if a shot ripped through the, to the powdered kegs, or if any of the burning planks fell down into the hold, he would be killed instantly in the explosion. Up he came again with as much powder as he could carry. After what must have seemed like forever, with the two ships tacking about each other like angry cats, the active lowered its flag. It had surrendered. Decatur brought his ship into Philadelphia, its guns still trained on the limping active. The crowd on the dock cheered wildly as they recognized the American flag on the Royal Lewis. On board the victorious ship, James Fortin had mixed feelings as he saw how so many of his comrades were wounded, some mortally. The Royal Lewis turned its prisoners over to military authorities. On the 27th of September, the active was sold. The proceeds were split among the owners of the Royal Lewis and the crew. The sailors with the worst wounds were sent off to be cared for. The others, their own wounds treated, were soon about the business of repairing the ship. Fortin must have been excited. Once the fear of the battle subsided and the wounded were taken off, it was easy to think about the dangerous encounter in terms of adventure, and they had won. The missing crew was replaced, the ship was checked carefully by its captain and found to be in fine fighting condition. The crew carried more ammunition aboard, more powder and fresh provisions. Once more, they sailed for open waters. On the 16th of October, 1781, they sighted a ship, recognized it as British, and made for it instantly. As they neared, a second ship was spotted, and then a third. Decatur turned to escape the trap, but it was already too late. The three British ships, the Amphion, the Nymph, and the Sloop Pomona, closed in. It was soon clear that the Royal Lewis had two choices, to surrender or to be sunk. The Royal Lewis lowered its flag. It had surrendered, and its crew were now prisoners. Fortin was terrified. He had heard the stories of the British sending captured Africans to the West Indies to be sold into slavery. He knew the Pomona had sailed back and forth from the colonies to the island of Barbados, where many Africans already languished in bondage. It was a time for dread. James was taken aboard the Amphion with others from the crew. On board the British ship, Captain Beasley inspected the prisoners. There were several boys among the American crew, and he separated them from the older men. Captain Beasley's son looked over the boys who had been captured. Many of them were younger than he was. Although they were still prisoners, the boys were given more freedom than the men. Beasley's son saw the Americans playing marbles. He joined in the game, and it was during this playing that he befriended Fortin. The result of this tentative friendship was that Captain Beasley did not, as he might have done, send Fortin to a ship bound for the West Indies in slavery. Instead, he was treated as a regular prisoner of war and sent to the prison ship, the Jersey. Dark and forbidding, the Jersey was a 60-gunner anchored off Long Island in New York. It had been too old to use in the war and had been refitted first as a hospital ship and then as a ship for prisoners. The portholes had been sealed in 20-inch squares carved into her sides. Across these squares, Iron bars were placed. The captain of the Jersey greeted the prisoners with a sneer. All were searched under the watchful eye of the British Marine. The wounded were unattended, the sick ignored. The pitiful cries of the other prisoners came from below decks. A few pale, sickly prisoners covered with sores were huddled around a water cask. Then came the cry that some would hear for months, others for years. Down, rebel, down! They were rebels against the king, to be despised, perhaps to be hanged. Traitors, they were being called, not soldiers of America. James was pushed into a line on deck. The line shuffled toward the water cask where each man could fill a canteen with a pint of water. Then they were pushed roughly below deck. The hold of the ship was dark. What little light there was came from the small squares along the hull. The air was dank. Some of the prisoners were moaning. Others manned pumps to remove the water from the bottom of the boat. Sleep was hard coming, and James wasn't sure if he wouldn't still be sold into slavery. Beasley's son had liked him, he remembered, and the boy had offered to persuade his father to take James to England. It would have been better than the hold of the Jersey. In the morning, the first thing the crew did was check to see how many prisoners had died during the night. 
Many of the prisoners were sick with yellow fever, and for these, death would be just a matter of time. Fortin later claimed that the game of marbles with Beasley's son had saved him from a life of slavery in the West Indies. But on November 1st, two weeks after the capture of the Royal Lewis, the news reached New York that Brigadier General Charles Cornwallis had surrendered to George Washington. Washington had strongly protested the British practice of sending prisoners to the West Indies. It was probably the news of his victory more than the game of marbles that saved the young sailor. James Fortin was not a hero. He did not single-handedly defeat the British or sink a ship. But he fought, like so many other Africans, for the freedom of America, and he fought well. He was only one of thousands of Africans who helped create the country known as the United States of America. In Philadelphia, after, war, after the war, James Fortin became an apprentice to the man his father had worked for, Robert Bridges. Like his father, James was a hard worker. Eventually, he would run the business for Robert Bridges, and by 1798, he owned it. At its height, the business employed 40 workers, both black and white. Fortin became one of the wealthiest men in Philadelphia. He married and raised a family, passing on to them the values of hard work that he had learned from his father. Fortin made several major contributions to the sail-making business, among them a method of handling the huge sails in a shop, which allowed the sails to be repaired much faster and saved precious time for ship owners. In the coming years, he would use his great wealth to support both anti-slavery groups and the right of women to vote. At a time when over 90% of all Africans in America were still in a state of enslavement, James Fortin became one of the most influential of the African abolitionists. He spent much of his life pleading for the freedom of his people in the country that his people had helped to create.